Right, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the question is, why did NAR sell Realtor.com? And the answer right. is because the board of directors didn't believe that the realtor organizations could compete with the new big technology companies and that it would be putting too much of the association of which they had a fiduciary duty to protect of putting the fiduciary of putting the association capital at risk and so they decided they couldn't do it now why did they decide that because first there was all these studies done that said the real estate industry has to change, technology's coming. If it doesn't, realtors are gonna get wiped out. Realtors gotta stay in the center of the transaction. What the year was this? 1991, 1992. I can give you all of the initial studies, right? Our okay. young study. So we, all these studies, there was an NAR presidential task force. They studied it. They said, we're roadkill unless we get into technology. We got to get into, people say, what are you talking about? We don't need technology. No, we got to get into technology. And so the NAR leadership, way ahead of anybody else, funded $13 million to build a technology solution, closed network, didn't know what it was because it was so early, funded it, it was called the Federation, later it came the Realtors Information Network, the, one of the birth, birthed realtor.com, when it was also, so NAR said, look, we got to get into this technology, but we are, we know our governance structure is slow. It takes forever to get things done. If we're going to compete, we got to create a, a separate company and it'll be a wholly owned subsidiary and we'll fund it. How much are you going to, what, what, 13 million was a lot of money for a startup. So it was a startup, $13 million. They put into this. They did all these studies. I was the first person they hired after as an, as a consultant, after they hired the leadership team, the president who brought up. You were technology. hired to sell it, right? To get people with their yeah, listings on Nobody there. knew what it was. No, at right. first, the listings weren't even there. At first, it was technology. Okay. How do you use technology? How can, what's a private network? What's an internet? What's an intranet? How can a broker use it in their business? What are the things that it might help a broker do? Somebody, does anybody volunteer? <laughs> right up, create the marketing pieces for this. And so, so it's a long story. We'll get back to why they sell realtor.com. So they created RIN. And in this process of creating a closed network, guess what everybody's going back to today? Closed, closed network. Closed networks, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. in a closed, secure network, they created with, with the help of the technology partner, which was Booz Allen Hamilton, a big technology company, and a small staff of people and lot and $13 million. And then what happened is the World Wide Web happened, because now mm -hmm. we're talking 1995, Netscape went public in 1996, all of a sudden people are using the web. Now all of a sudden, what all of us were, it's kind of like a dream in most people's mind, few of us were using it, it was text based. All of a sudden the web arrived. Yeah. And so the idea was maybe you could take listings and put them on the web and get people to go there. And the idea came from Walt Bukowski and me and a guy named Richard Jansen, who built 50 kiosks and put them in Long's Drug Store. And we get, he got the contract for our <laughs> listings in San Diego and put them on all these, right? So put them on these drug stores. So here's the internet. So people go into drugstores to look at, for houses? Yeah, that was a whole nother thing, right? That didn't work, but it was on this path. So the idea was we'll get all the listings, we'll put them on one site, we'll get realtors to just put their listings in one place. We'll okay. put them in one place, everybody will wanna go there. So it'll become worth a gazillion dollars. It'll be like the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so we'll just put them in one place and we'll, then we'll charge people a dollar a listing a month. Dollar a listing a month. And then that, with that, you could do a spreadsheet, you could do an analysis, you could say if you got all the MLSs, you got all the listings, here's how much revenue it creates, here's how much money, right. then you can start selling advertising, you do a whole business plan, now you got something, it's worth a lot of money. Yeah. So, so the first listings to go up were my MLS in San Diego, and that was through, an interesting, that was didn't cost anything, it was for demo purposes, so that went up, That's and good. I got, they, and so I was the only realtor on this group of about six people. Uh, Bob Goldberg was one of them, who's now the CEO of NAR, That's they needed somebody to say, well, put together, how do you, realtors were afraid of giving away their data back then. There was this fear of something called public access to the MLS, and everybody was afraid. And I was a CAR, or a California director, and I remember realtors went nuts because somebody stole MLS books out of the dumpsters 
and then had the ad, had the phone numbers of who was selling and sellers were getting phone calls from moving companies. And, and so the people were just deathly afraid. This was our asset. And, it, and so somebody and had and to come in and say, here's now. this new- I know, uh, you know, yeah. yeah well, so, so we were very protective. And so who is gonna go and get in front of realtors and say, forget about all that stuff. We got this new thing called the World Wide Web. We're gonna charge you a dollar listing a month. It's gonna be great. Everyone's gonna love it. How do you know, Salt? Because it's gonna be great and everybody's gonna go there and everybody's gonna see your listings. And then if any leads come in, you'll get them. Okay. Dollar listing a month. Okay. Austin signed the contract. Dollar first presentation. The presentation was done on black and white acetate overheads. <laughs> Use the internet. Super, now we're right? going no, super there was no cool. direct connection to the internet back then. Right? <laughs> like I would check into a hotel and I would plug, unplug the phone and then plug the line. I lick it to say, ah, yeah, that's a hot line. I know. I plug into this, my desk, into my laptop computer because it was was primitive and you were connecting at slow speeds, but the idea was the web. People would want to look right. for property on the web. Right. So let's do it, let's own it. And so a great amount of that $13 million then got allocated towards building something we called realtor.com. Okay. And so we got ready to launch realtor.com, but, but there were other portals in the marketplace and there was homes.com and there was homeseekers.com. And there was, and, and Microsoft was jumping into the fray and Microsoft had a site and it was called homeadvisor.com, oh, okay. which is it's a completely different thing to use the domain for today. So Microsoft jumped in, we launched at the convention in Atlanta in 1996. Mm -hmm. I was the first person to ever do live presentations on the convention floor. <laughs> now cool. everybody does it, right? You walk right. out there, there's nobody did it back then. And so I was pitching, our listings were on realtor.com and Microsoft launched Home Advisor and they said, we'll do it for free. Oh, man. And back then, oh. you might remember there were browser wars and was, Netscape was the browser, but Microsoft got had had Internet Explorer embedded into the operating system. So it just mm -hmm. took over because it had this monopoly. So they were like powerful. Now, the DOJ broke, pulled the Explorer browser out. But what happened was our directors, the model, the business model that had been created, a dollar listing per month. That, all of a sudden, the business model crashed. Right. And the, and the directors who are realtors like you guys and like me, I don't, right, don't practice anymore, but realtors are the directors of NAR. They were af really afraid that you couldn't compete, that they'd be jeopardizing the assets of the entity, that the best thing they could possibly do is somehow salvage what they could and spin this thing off and get this liability off their back. So Richard Jansen, the kiosk guy, put together, along with a number of other people, the, uh, an investment group with the intention of taking it public. And that's what they did. And NAR made 100 million, 50 to 100, made like $100 million. Wow. Because there, so there was a, there was a stock. It feels though NAR. like, like it's, when you're explaining this, it does feel like it would be an easy sell. Like if you, they offered it for free, like Microsoft, but they're like, hey, we can control the data or you can give it to Microsoft. I would think everybody would want it to keep like in-house or so. No, no, nobody even understood data. Right. They didn't yeah. even get it. Oh, yeah, here's right. a whole nother conversation. And, uh, here's a right, whole nother conversation. Yeah, they didn't know. In 2000, 2008, January 2008, I become, became the CEO of a company called Point Two Technologies. Yeah. And what, what, what I was going to do is, and they were getting listing information from agents and syndicating it out to all these new websites. I was going to go directly to MLSs and get the data directly. Why did I think I could do that? Because I did it for Realtor.com. Right. Back, I was the first person that went out to all these MLSs and put a contract. So I went out and I, with, I hired Walt Pekowski, who runs the San Francisco Association, who was on the original RIN board of directors. Uh, and Walt and I were able to, with a team of people, to acquire about 500 contracts in 18 months with MLS as an association. This is 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010. We had 1.5 million listings. They all came with data contracts that had no data restrictions in them. Oh, wow. None, this is 2008, no data restrictions in them. And so now, so now I'd be a billionaire if I had, yeah. what I had then, yeah. Right? If I had all those MLSs, I had no data restrictions. And I that's what I had. I was the CEO of the company. Had all, and everybody wanted data from me. And I gave it to them. That was what we did. We took the data. We normalized it. We gave, we gave it to So Zillow. the benefit, <laughs> the reason why the MLSs signed the contract is 
were they getting paid or no? Which, which contract? The contract was... for point two. Let's like back no. up a little bit. No. 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 So nobody knew what it was worth. As a matter of fact, back in those days, like I had a, I was, I spoke everywhere. I was like, you know, and how you win these awards, like the 10 years in a row, I was always like, right. So I was doing all this stuff and I would sit on these panels with these names that we recognize today. Uh -huh. And I would say this data is worth something. We don't know what it's worth, but it's worth something. The consumer data, behavioral data is worth something. We don't want to give this away. We, and then of course, the people who ran the other companies, they would say, no, it's all no, it's not worth. Really worth anything. <laughs> right. And so, and nobody would agree with me and I couldn't, you know, actually prove, but I knew, so that my mind, the way you do this, you get all the data you put on the internet and all of a sudden you threaten people, you take it away and then you'll find out what it's worth. Right. And so we got all the data. We did. I got all these contracts, but then I realized that the people giving me the contracts didn't understand data rights or data rights management. That was a brand new kind of thing. So then Zillow wanted the contract and I didn't want to give them and Trulia wanted contracts and I didn't want to give them contracts that gave them data rights, but I didn't want to be, I wasn't in business to piss people off. I didn't want to say you can't have it. And I really didn't have the authority. Actually, I, I had the authority in that and actually created a, a, a project. I called it contract alignment. I went back to the MLSs and associations. I said, here's what you have to know. I only want you to give me contracts that allow me to do certain things mm -hmm. because then I don't have to argue with Zillow and I don't have to argue with Trulia right. and I don't have to argue with you because you gave me a contract that says I can only do these certain things. Well, and you can't those? like resell it or whatever, right? Like right? You can't, derivative or big thing, derivative works. You can't take it and build other products out of it. Uh, right. You can't sell the data. You can't re-syndicate. There are all these things. Yeah, then, but isn't point two... It, Weren't you re-syndicating it? Like, isn't that the whole thing about- No, so when I was at point two, I don't know what they do now. No, but when, when was, you were there, yeah. No, we would take it firsthand from the MLS. And, and then, wouldn't you send it out we, and to then like- we, would, we were the syndicator. We were the party that went in because all this, all these listings came to us in different languages. Right. Somebody had to take these, these listings and put them in the same language so you could send them out to people and they could understand. And so like at, at that there. time, there was there, there was Zillow and there was true, uh, truly. We were the right? ones that gave them, we we're, were one of the primary providers of data to them. Okay. Right. So yeah. they, matter of fact, they grew their businesses often based on the speed at which my company could acquire listings. Right. Right. So the CEO of Zillow was Spencer Raskoff. You probably know Spencer. Spencer used to call me. Spencer was, Saul, when are you going to get Dallas? Saul, when are you going to get this guy? When you, right? Why? Because he was building this billion dollar company based mm -hmm. on the listing information. I was not charging the MLS to do this and I was not getting anything for it. I was trying to figure out the business model to right. where the MLS is, right? We had that where we're trying to figure that out. Matter of fact, the, my, my company, my CTO and I used to kid, we knew where the end of the rainbow was, but we didn't have bus fare to get there. Oh, yeah. shit. But let me ask we you, had, so if you, if you would have did the um, contract alignment, like you said, and say, hey, you only give me rights. And one of those rights is like, you can't re-syndicate it, whatever. So you syndicate over to like Zillow, Trulia, Homes.com, Home Advisor, all these places, right? Yeah. Yeah. How would that have stopped those companies from still being what they were? Because they are, they are what they are because of the original data, right? No. So I don't really understand the question, but so they got the data from us. And when they did, we actually went back to the industry and we built a contract. Okay. Right. And so we went back and we hired a law firm. By then, Mike, I got, we sold the company. We sold to the wrong company, unfortunate, another story. We sold the company. And so I got the company to say, let's go to an, hire a law firm that represents MLSs. And let's work with the law firm, number one law firm in this area of data and data rights management. Let's work with them. And their clients are all MLSs. Let's work mm -hmm. with them to create a contract that every MLS will accept. Mm -hmm. And we'll put that contract together. And then when we, point two, go to MLSs, we'll give them the contract that their attorneys have already that they've already looked at. Right. And now what we do is then and at some point people will realize there's value here and they'll start charging. But, but what happened was we sold the company and the syndication piece got sold to realtor.com. So it never got to that. But get back to your question about why did they sell realtor.com? The people did it with good intention, with responsibility in mind, 
they thought that they were and in a normal world it would have, that's what it would have been the end result was what they ended up losing the rights to probably uh one of the greatest assets and new ideas right when but they, they didn't did that. know but they didn't know and it wasn't because they were pioneers to begin with right there were many many people sitting on the sidelines that don't do it we don't want to go there we want to keep our listings to ourselves we don't want people to know that they're there well now listings are a commodity you can get them anywhere on the internet from any right, everywhere source. and right. there are no rules right and so um so when people ask the story, why did NAR sell? Why wow, they sold us up the river? It, it wasn't like that, right? So that's that's text out of context. Okay. Right. So then the um, so who owns Realtor.com? So again, it's Move.com. And what is Rupert Murdoch's? I mean, I have to look it up. I know it all the time, but you, you can Google it. Rupert Murdoch okay. owns. It's it's uh, real famous. You, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, media company. It's a big, big media company. Rupert Murdoch's media company. Is it Forbes? No. What media companies? He owns Fox News, Wall Street Journal, Journal, Harper Collins. This is all owned by one conglomerate, though. I don't know. So that's who owns it, right? So, and you can buy Rupert Murdoch. News Corp? News Corp. That's it. Okay. Yep, so uh, News Corp owns Realtor.com, it owns the Wall Street Journal, it owns Fox News, it's a media company. Right. Right? And so the, the data that it gets from an MLS is just part of the, of the fly paper. But is that data market. that they get from the MLS now, does the, do those contracts ever end or are they like ongoing in perpetuity? Well, they're, they're probably not in perpetuity. I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at one in a long time, but I'm sure that they could end, that they could terminate. That'd be their individual contracts. It's another thing people don't understand about MLSs and associates. It's not like NAR has a string, pulls a string and all these MLSs follow right along. Right. It's really kind of hard to get them to do things. They all are separate. Right. And so um, each one has a different has a separate contract, probably okay. probably very so we were when I was doing it, remember, I signed up the first 500 MLSs. Mm -hmm. I've matter of fact, I probably got a three ring binder that has the original contracts in it. <laughs> that makes so garage. cool. Right? Yeah, it's got all the original contracts in them. And so I was the one that went out and got those contracts signed. They're all different contracts. You try when you're doing uh, contract management you're trying not to have different versions right no kidding uh, when you're it's trying to too scale complicated right? to manage yeah. yeah so people okay so the misconception is one that nar um owns realtor.com it is not true they they well, are they're, a separate they're completely company. unrelated right. right now let's let's be real technical the domain realtor.com that yes that's a trademark Right. So, so how does they completely, you, you would think that when they took over that website and bought realtor.com that they would have been required to they change were. the name to something no, else. No, they weren't required to change the name. They got a license. Right. They got a license agreement to use the trademark. But I can't That's get a license is. agreement as an actual realtor to use it <laughs> for the podcast. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh no, they got, they got that. Remember this was a fire sale thought, right? This, they were trying right. to unload this and that was where people yeah, went. But but what about, so a licensing agreement is an agreement and it ends. Maybe. So this was, a, you have to go back and look. This was a thousand page document. A thousand pages that gave realtors tremendous power to designate and state what went on on that website. Okay. Okay. So, so initially, a lot of negotiation. The outcome was a thousand page agreement. Now, during that, the first 11 years of the operation of Realtor.com, it was the number one most visited real estate website in the world. That's nothing mm -hmm. to scoff at. Right. The number yeah. one most visited real estate website in the world for 11 years. But you had yeah. these upstarts that were starting to come in and they yeah. were starting to get access to the MLM. They, they started to figure out, hey, these are all separate. We can go out and get contracts or we can find companies like Point2 and List Hub 
Like and the MLSs would agree to that in theory because it seems like if you put the advertising everywhere, that's better for the group of agents. Well, so they were already doing that. So okay. right, right, right when NAR decided to spin off Realtor.com, the reason they did is Microsoft was offering it for free. Right. And once Microsoft started offering it for free, everybody had to go to free because no realtor was going to pay to have their listings up anywhere. Right. They just weren't going to do it because it was free. And so. So then they, they sold. So are they. OK, so the um, MLSs are then using like selling the data. Which they no, guess so the MLS didn't sell it. So the ML and this, I was part of the whole socializing process to get people to do this, right? And so the, it wasn't it wasn't about paying the MLS. It was there's going to be value, but we don't know what it is yet. Okay. The initial value is we can get the data from you. We can we can have some control over it. It's not just any data going out anywhere, and you can choose. And we I my company built that you can choose opt in opt out turn it on train my philosophy as the ceo was build in the access and the capability for realtors to do anything they want to do even though we know they'll probably never do it because when i had to get up in front of a board of directors to say here's what this does i knew i'd get questions well what if i don't want that well what if i want to do this so we wanted to be able to build it so they had the opportunity to do that and so um what was the question? I think I'm still asking the question about, okay, so as the MLS, I can I can see it's not a stretch for me to say, okay, we want to syndicate to realtor.com. Where I still have the question is once that was sold, why would, well, one, why would we continue to syndicate there? And why did we syndicate to all these other third parties? So number one, the realtor.com thing, that was the MLS. The MLS went out and got contracts. They could end them. How do I know? I got the first 500 contracts. Right. right? They went out and got the contracts. That was a package. That was part of the value. It was a network. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That was part sense. of the value of this whole thing was all these listings were coming and went public. And AR made $100 million. And members made $100 million. They got out from under something that they didn't think they'd be able to. So that's separate. Then, then what happened was, and the reason they sold it off was realtors were putting their listings everywhere agents were putting their listings up where their brokers had first of all the brokers didn't even know there was a world wide web and secondly the agents were putting this stuff up and it was saying thing like keys under the map and uh, don't let the dog out and be careful small children and all of this stuff that you'd never want to put in the public domain and this is the kind of stuff that was happening so part okay. of the idea with syndication was hey and so I'm the salesman I'm going to go to your board I'm your MLS your board of directors I'm going to say look this is all happening but if you give us a feed, by the way, here's all your brokers. They all want your, they all want their listings sent to these places. Right. And they're doing it anyway. Right. So let's make your association what I refer to as the first point of contact. You want to be the first point of contact. And then we have the apparatus. We've built the application that will allow your agents and your brokers to send the data where they want to. And it'll only be specified fields and it won't be the wild, wild west. And to the degree, degree that we can do that and people don't do it on their own, that cleans up the internet. It clean, So that's what it is. Some, right? some okay, integrity. so the benefit yeah. to the MLSs was that, like you said, they became the first point, they regained their control of being the first point of contact. And it was a service they could offer their members. Right, and the members were doing it anyway, haphazardly yeah. and just like randomly. Right. So now so they go maintain up to their the listing. integrity of the data and, and yeah. make it a nice, right. clean presentation. So now they're right. going up to their website. Now, so think about it. I put the listing up, but I forget about it. So it's sold six months ago, but it's mm -hmm. still on this website. Right. It's it was at, everywhere. Ago, right? Right. But now if we can hook it to the MLS, when a listing comes out, is taken off the market, if the transaction changes, all of a sudden, the information we get to put on the web has been cleansed because it came out of the MLS. Yeah, and it, right. it creates this cleaner data. It creates, uh, creates a better right. consumer experience. It's better for the real it's Better everything. It's right. just a better deal. And Until what it's it not. Cost? Well, and what did it cost? It cost nothing. And the reason it cost nothing, what did we get? We gave it as it was a service. And we were trying to help the industry figure out a way to monetize it. Now, tell you what, it's all monetized now. It just doesn't get monetized at the level of the MLS. It's all monetized. What's been created is a broker said, I'll, if you give me free advertising, 
put my listing on your site. If you give me free advertising, I don't care what you do with the data. Yeah, and so and for you know for right. fifty bucks in an ad, they gave away billions of dollars in the potential that comes from this, and that's where the industry ended up. And but it's not like anybody tried to sell anybody out, or that there was any ill intention. It was that's that's how things evolve, and people just don't have the whole story. So why would it, uh, an MLS do this? Because the broker said, "Can you create something that makes us makes it easy for us to send our listings out?" Yeah, because it's a benefit for the agent, right? Like we want the listings everywhere because we want to find a buyer for the seller. Like that's how it works. So like I can see that it's just kind of created this like web of nightmares. Well, well, yeah, so what it, it is, it has yeah. at this point, kind of, and it could kind be, of, it could get of. a lot worse easily. Yeah, it could get a lot, really, it could get a lot worse. Yeah. And um, so when I had to, to it, I got hired as CEO of Point Two, and they had this apparatus to begin to take data. And so I could see this was the future, and I wanted to create this different way to do it. And I was, was going to go to MLSs, and nobody believed you could do that, but I already knew I could because I had done it before. Right. And I knew that I could even hire Walt, who he'd done it with me before. And I knew that we could go out and we could get the data and we'd be able to do this, right? And be able to get this data. We didn't know it would come with unfettered contracts. And so we had to teach the industry about this. And I think we were successful in doing that. But remember, people are under this impression that things should be free. And that's that whole, a whole other story about the internet and about um, the, the marketplaces now or and people get everything free and they don't realize what it is. And that takes me to the, the, the story of, you know, it's a big yellow taxi. You don't know what you got till it's gone. So right. it's easy to give away rights when you don't know you have them. We do and it all the time. You do it all the time in a lot of different things. Well, we just didn't even know we had all these rights and these, and these real estate uh, data assets. And so people, if you don't know what you got till it's gone, right? Yeah. Take paradise, put up a parking lot. And that, that's exactly what's happened. And so now is, so you can see, I think now you can, now you can take back your future. Oh, you can never take your listings away from Zillow. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, you my can. consumers expect it. Baloney. I don't think a consumer You can't take them anything. away from Zillow, though, because Zillow is a brokerage. Right. Now, now it's an well, IDX. Only, as only because to. it's IDX, right? right. Yeah. And, but you might opt out. Of, you could take them down. You can opt out of IDX if you opt out altogether. Right. So there are ways to opt out if that's what you're. So, but then you're, you're so. opting out of the IDX feed to your website as well. No, you can use your data for anything you want. Okay. The question is, is your MLS, can it send you your data? Is it capable of sending you, right? I mean, there's there's the technical side. Right, right. There's the technical part of it. So so where are we today? We've got uh, Zillow. We've got all these portals. I coined this phrase, distribution trumps destination, mm -hmm. because I read it in a magazine and it made sense to me because I saw realtors putting up their listings in different places. And I knew that they couldn't determine that they didn't have the expertise to figure out what was the best place to put your listing. Right. And so you tell this realtor, they didn't put it up on one place and they put it up on one place. And I say, how, well, what would make the most sense? Why do you put it up there? Does that get the most traffic? I don't know. They and don't know. If you don't yeah, know. It was, the easiest, it was then, just the easiest way from point A to but, point B but, without well, a lot of thought. And the, so the best way to make sure you hit the, the good ones as well as the bad ones, is you put it everywhere. Everywhere, right. right. And that was the distribution trumps destination. It's not about the destination. You're never, you're very rarely will you pick the right destination. You got a better chance of picking the right destination if you put it in a lot of places. And if you put it in a lot of places, there's a good chance that one of those places is the right destination. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's that where the buyer is looking. Theory, right? Yeah. Was there anything in that original um agreement, that thousand page agreement when they sold off realtor.com and gave them the licensing to be able to, to use that name that held that, that company then accountable to any kind of standards that the realtor name is supposed to stand for? I'm sure there were lots of things, but here's what happened. Over the with 11 years, uh, realtor.com was number one. In the 11th or 12th year, then Zillow becomes number one, Trulia right. becomes number two, realtor.com becomes number three. What they discovered was the restrictions in the contract were preventing Realtor.com from being competitive. And so Realtor.com, so it went through ownership changes, like where it ends up with Rupert Murdoch. And on the way right. to doing that, there were several times where the directors were called back together to go over the contract to remove certain restrictions that would allow Realtor.com to be more competitive in the marketplace. And so that thousand page contract, I don't know what it is now and what it's whittled down to. I know right. originally it was very restrictive. 
right? And, and it but would seem, you know, when you look at the what the the word realtor is supposed to stand for, there's the code of ethics that, that's mm-hmm. attached to that. And when the general public and everybody else under the sun thinks realtor.com is owned by NAR, that would be the logical thought if you're just a member of the it's public. It's super logical that that's it's accurate. It's super logical that that's what mm-hmm. you think. And then when there's zero tr- in the code of ethics talks all about transparency and truth and advertising and all of these other things, we don't see any of that when you're talking about realtor.com as a website. Because yeah, the no, I haven't thinks, done it's a really, forensic, thinks it's this and it's really this. Yeah, well, I haven't done a forensic audit to see how compliant it is with code of ethics and whatnot, but it is not owned by NAR, right? So right. it's not gonna, right. So it doesn't, right. so, it could be called anything. Right. Yeah, and but there's two, so I don't think that'll ever change, right? But there are things, so here's the thing, in my mind, this is the opportunity to change the world. Yeah, let's right, do right it. Let's blow that time. shit up and start right, over. Right now is the time. Let's, let's look at Zillow for a minute. I think this is really important for people to understand. For years and years and years, realtors have been saying Zillow's estimates are inaccurate. Zillow's mm-hmm. estimates are inaccurate, right? Zillow's estimates are inaccurate. People, then they say, oh, but my buyer says this. My seller says this. I looked at my house on Zillow. Everything's on Zillow. And every the realtors are saying, no, Zillow's inaccurate. Well, you know, we hear a couple of weeks ago, Zillow was in the eye buying uh, right. arena right. and what happened is they first said they slowed it down but then as it turns out they say we're out of this i buy business why we're buying our houses too expensive isn't that ironic <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> we're we're not not it. <laughs> they're telling everybody what properties are worth and they got all right. this great credibility even though they say we're not accurate but everybody right but and that's so the they, fine print that's point two that no one's reading anyway you know that but, you have to blow yeah, up for so your market analysis appointments but they have to lay off 25 percent of their employees right. 25 percent that's a of lot you know why they don't really have a balance sheet they have to take all this right off they're going to lose money on this why because they bought high and sold low right right so buy high sell low just the opposite well we anybody with half a brain should have been figured out that the company that can't figure out what properties are worth i'm not get a lot of rub for this but the fact <laughs> probably is, not be no i buying secret. houses <laughs> we have people that idiots to think that, that that right i mean just and the fact is that it's probably worse than anybody believes that there was no supervision or that right. how they went about buying and selling this way. So they've sold two, they're getting ready to sell 2000. They got 18,000 more to sell. At it least. shows that you can be entrenched and you can be a giant leader. And, and all of a sudden, one of the business moves you make can tip you over. Now people say, Oh, they're too mm-hmm. strong. Oh, they're they, 25% of your work. Tell you, I'll tell you, well, your biggest expense are your employees. And so when you've yeah. got people come, when you've got the bills are coming after you, if you really want to make a difference, there's really only one place you can go. You have to go to where the labor you're paying them. You got to go to the labor. Right. And with 25%, do you think 25% right. of their people were involved in their iBuyer? Pro- I don't think so. No. I think it was a, they had a cut across the board. Mm-hmm. Cut. So I think they're vulnerable. Yeah. And Absolutely. you can tell me all, people tell me all they want, that they're not, they're this, they're that. Hey, you really didn't need Zillow or anybody else to sell a house in the last four years. Right. I mean, right. I mean, well, exactly. well, and I don't really know ran. how much market share they actually had, really. Truly. I mean, really. Do you? Well, so, no, I don't know. But now they're a broker that people yeah. still perceive as a portal. Yeah. Right. Now, you know, when Redfin first came out, Redfin's a broker. Redfin's always been a broker. But when, right. when Redfin right. first came out, agents perceived them as a portal. But they're and, a broker. And, yeah, They're, and they always have been a broker and agents and I would go, agents right. would say they send their clients to Redfin because the data is better. Of course, the data is better. It's a vow and they've got direct right. access to the MLS. But if you work for Century 21, would you really send your clients to Coal Banker? Because when no. you send them to Redfin, I know, but there is like a lot. Well, of- when you send them there, they can hit a button and have somebody pop tart over to the house in five minutes. It's like so it's that, nuts. there's even. The, but, that's even the worst option if and, you're going to pick any horrible option that's the but worst. that's what zillow should do and then sell the appointments have it because they already own showing time which most realtors tons of realtors use and they own right. dot loop anyway you have showing time you put the schedule for the house on make it public and then have the have uh, buyers pick their time and then sell that slot to the realtors. Maybe here's what I want to do. I want to start a movement. Okay. And, and I in. want, and I want, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm in. <laughs> and I want to create a property commons, a real like Wikipedia parcel based 
and everybody just goes up and starts loading and you have just like Wikipedia, right? You have to be approved right. to be an editor and it wasn't great at first and over time it got better and better. And why couldn't you take that same theme and like the comments and anybody can use the data that's there. It's built on a blockchain. It's all tagged. Everybody knows what it is, who owns what, where the permissions go. You can make sure it aligns with privacy. And okay. so that's deep. That's deeper than you want to go. So the idea is a commons. Okay. Like where people share photos or sh in this case, we share information about it's called Facebook. Uh, <laughs> they got they write the rules. Okay. You really don't want that, right? So, you know, Facebook is kind of a community platform, but it's a very restricted community platform. You know, so you, you like you write something, you put it up on Facebook, you put it out to a group with 200,000 people, 200,000 people don't see it, you know, right. maybe 20. I mean, I have no idea how many people yeah. really see it. And right. it's not the same as, as if you, we, we actually created communities on, on platforms where okay. people belonged where and wanted to see what, right? So, it, but Facebook will never grow into that because it has, it's built on that old model that scared everybody that put Realtor.com out on its own. Yeah. The free, the free model. So what right. happened? So you build this commons, you put the data by the parcel in there, and then then what? So if I'm a realtor, I'm going to make sure in my neighborhood, I put everything I can into this and that I'm on record and that my name is tied to all the data. And so part of what I do is somebody in the real estate business is I'm tied to the real estate. Okay. Right. And so uh, someday that might be monetized. And if it got figured out, if it was done in a way that kind of like ASCAP or like the music business, where if I start loading pictures in a neighborhood, it might not be worth anything, but 10 years from now, who knows what 10 years worth of photos of a property might be worth to somebody who's building an app or doing something that we haven't dreamed about yet today. Might be mm -hmm. well worth it for the tax assessor to jack up your taxes a little bit more. Well, yeah, it depends on where you are. In California, <laughs> right. it's, uh, it just depends on what you sell it for. Yeah. Right, right. right. So um, you know, a, pro a property wiki concept, A it was, here's the other right. And the purpose is so that the data is- The data is accurate. Data is accurate. And owned by owned by what we today call MLSs. So what if we got MLSs to be the foundation of this? And then we I was thinking the MLS and like auditor or whatever, and, like and then for we, the transfer. And then we figure out how you monetize that data without hurting the people who provide the data or in a way to reward the people who provide the data. So I will tell you within data flows, and you know this to be true, uh, deal flow is often important. People like to know uh, in the, what's selling, when it's selling, how much it's selling for, not who's buying it. Yeah. Right. right. Was it um, GameStop, right? They drove that whole stock got, yeah. Because right, you can trade for free today. Right. Why can you trade for free? Because the hedge funds say you can trade for free. We'll pay for your trades because they want to know who's trading. They don't want to know who, they want to know what's getting traded. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. just knowing what's getting traded has got a value. Right. And so somebody would buy that. That's a valuable piece. That piece, if collected from every MLS in the country, wouldn't hurt one single broker, but that one piece might be able to fund all the MLSs in the country. It might be that and then valuable. the MLS, we don't have any MLS dues and we detach, we detach from the national also. We could. It, well, and the way to do that is we would have to pay for our own Arizona mission insurance if we wanted to do that because okay. the primary benefit in being a realtor MLS is the fact that you get, when you get sued for antitrust, notice I didn't say if you get sued for antitrust, when you get sued for antitrust, you've got an insurance policy, you've got some backing, you've got some help with the big legal work behind you. And that's the big reason. Now, can that be provided for privately? Sure, you can pay the fee and you can, so that's a possibility. He froze. We lost you. You froze. <laughs> you so froze. I say, so we took just, some good pictures of you. <laughs> yeah, just think about the about if the about roof in the MLS. There's always something for age of roof. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is there? Yeah. A, no. Uh, so, no. So we say, oh, let's use it as an example, or or style of roof, or uh, whatever. How do you yes. is it a style. shape roof or a composite? So yeah. right. that's valuable data if you could scale it if you could know where all of the shake roofs in the world are and all of the composite roofs and all of the that would might be valuable to an insurance company absolutely 
It might, but who gets making money on that? Nobody yet. See, there's all, we, we sit on all this data. That- but the problem with the MLS and the data coming from there is that the data is not checked. It's garbage in, garbage out. Like people- There's no make, integrity of it. And no yeah, integrity to the data like we were talking they about. They made so it. many mistakes. Well, so here's the thing. It's the most accurate data there is. It's not even- it's okay. the most accurate. You show me a be- you show me a better database. There isn't any better database. I think as a whole, now. that's correct. Yeah. No, it sense. is. There's no way. Yeah. Because the Zillow and the rest would be looking. But it's at entered other by realtors. They can't even read the agent <laughs> remarks. They're it, not it, putting it, it, that it, shit in, right? Well, and that's maybe now it might be a little bit worse than at other times. But no, it's still the very best, the very cleanest. But now you add a component. If we had a place where all the information went about all the properties and we created little communities around there and then as a realtor as a responsible realtor because there are responsible realtors and irresponsible realtors yeah. yes. but if somebody Most who's certainly. in the business i'm saying you know what i'm going to start making sure that all this is correct because i know if i do my name is going to go next to it as the person who's made the corrections and I'm going to enter this into the system. And then and you have- think that, that that movement is the beginning of like taking back control of the data. Absolutely, yes. And building more data and monetizing. More accurate data it. and then and monetizing then, it. And then this gives the realtors time to figure out that part of what their job in the future is, is to manage data and to manage information and to know more about a neighborhood then another realtor knows about the neighborhood. And if, and if in fact, there's a public record that shows I've been going up there making changes. Oh, Jennifer added a room addition to her house. I noticed this. I took some pictures. Then over time, this becomes like an encyclopedia. Of, now, who should own it? MLS, realtors should own it. And then how do we pay for it? We figure out all of the, and it never all is a bad word, right? We figure out, data packages i call it exhaust data it's data nobody would use for anything anyway and we figure out we say you know what if we knew all the vinyl floors here maybe the people that sell hardwood floors would like to know all of the vinyl floors in this neighborhood so that they can construct their marketing campaign or whatever so there's different values to different sets and subsets of data that nobody's thought about and all instead we just give it all away in and it's easy to give away because we don't know what it's worth. It's a big yellow taxi thing, right? right and so right. we just never thought about, geez, the insurance companies would pay for the, the companies that uh, buy mortgages, the companies that buy mortgages in the secondary market have a lot of money invested. Do you think that for they might like to know what areas are the fire areas? Does this create a monopoly? Uh, we, I guess you have to cross that bridge when you get to it. Hopefully that it would create, and there's nothing wrong with the monopoly. What's wrong is if the monopoly powers are not used correctly, right? right? That there are always, there are monopolies or forms of monopolies. Would this be not? So in the real estate world, if when people tell me MLS is a monopoly, what I think they're saying is that I can't sell real estate unless I use the MLS. Right, right. Which is not time. true. That's not which true. Is not true. Which is That's not true. Which is not true. That's not true at all. No. no, so I MLS don't think it's is enough. just like an advertising thing. It's, but it's you a platform can... to offer compensation, is what the so, MLS so is. I, so I'm answering agents. your question. I, I think it's cooperation, right? Or is it compensation? No, because you can cooperate. It's compensation. It's co- right. You it's can cooperate without, without an offer through the MLS. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, isn't there a thing like, aren't there companies out there, uh, brokerages that are putting the listings up and not offering compensation? Well, then they're not doing it through the yes. MLS. The MLS, they are. Matter, not, that's that's no, what the not. that's what the mold oh, they're model. not. They're doing it through their. I got you. Okay, they're doing okay, it through okay, their okay, very okay. own yeah. website, very own portal, and then yeah. there is no offer because if you're in the MLS, you have to offer compensation. That's the whole point. Okay, so, so the you original can, you can cooperate. I could cooperate with you as an agent without paying any money. With without paying any money at right. all. Right. Okay, right. but not through the MLS. Okay, I got it. Right. All right. Yep. So the original question is why did NAR sell realtor.com. And the answer is because they thought it was in the best interest of realtors. Their members. They thought it was in the best interest. Exactly. Whoops. <laughs> but it was a long time before it wasn't, right? And, and it was a long time before it wasn't. And, there, and you know, there was the path right up until 2011. There was, we were on the path to maintain this. 
Okay. And we lost and we lost it in 2011. And do you think there's any possibility we're going to get that back? Yeah, if we do the movement, it's all set. Um, we're we're trying. So there are, in my mind. How do you tell a bunch of realtors what to do? Let's be honest. But that's <laughs> always been a problem, right? Yeah, right. That's that's not new. Cats, they say. But it's but, hurting I, but, cats. But but here's here's what feral cats. Here's the the pitch, and it's true. Here's the pitch: you shouldn't have to pay to provide data to people who make a lot of money around it. Right. At least you should be able to do it for nothing. And okay. maybe you even ought to share beyond that. And so the message is, let's figure out a way because we can. And we always say this, that, that as we move into the future, you got to figure out strategic planning. You got to figure out where your strengths are. And when a paradigm shifts, you have to use your strengths to carve out your position in the future. Right. Because your unknown know future. Be major, yeah. I know, you know, but I think you can figure it out. It comes through vision. Right. So you can figure out your future, what your future should be. That you, now you can plan to get to that future and it will involve data and it will involve data rights and it will involve blockchain. And what you're still doing as a realtor is you're providing fuel for other people's fires. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it the that fuel can be utilized in a number of different ways. And I believe that, that MLS executives, that we have a lot of bright MLS executives, really smart people, dedicated people, loyal people, been around this for a long time, understand different degrees of this. The question that Rachel asked was, is it too late to take it back? No, I, I believe that we actually can as we, as we learn more about data and the value of data and the fact that most people that provide data to companies who then monetize it get paid for that. Mm -hmm. And so the economic model of MLS needs to change. And it's we're, we're living in a world where it's possible for that economic model to change. And it's as simple as the idea of if you have valuable content that people want to see, it's they, going to attract eyeballs yeah. and people are going to make money. And so right. how do we make sure that the people providing that aren't taken advantage of? Right. And if we can do that, we can keep the realtor in the center of the conversation. And so while some of the functions of the realtor might change and go away, they'll still be the center of the transaction. Right. The center of the conversation. And as long as they can, it's like an octopus, right? As long as you can handle all the different pieces and one of them is going to be the data and how that's handled. And the MLS is going to be a piece of this if it does it correctly. Then there's a future in this, as everybody always says there is, because it's the people. There's a future in this for realtors. But if, but if all you're going to do is what we did 25 years ago, you don't have a lot of people. I know. Come on, we definitely have to evolve. I don't know. That's a yeah, interesting. Well, Saul, if um, if people want to connect with you, if they want to learn more, they want to get the context for everything that's going on. What's the best place to go to? How do they reach you? Yeah, a couple of places. You can go to realtown.com. That's a good one. -T -O -W. You can go to realtown.com. We're bringing that one back because it's capable of holding much more content for us. Yes. Realtown.com. And then the dataadvocate.com is our blog. So we're using that just for the short pieces that we write every day. And then we're storing it on realtor.com, on, excuse me, on realtown.com. So realtown.com, the dataadvocate.com, and uh, Saul klein at realtown.com or saul at better call saul dot realtor and the secret for my for me an email is that it all goes to one mailbox there you go <laughs> so, <good>. so <laughs> now i'm not gonna find you exactly you're easy and rachel if people um have a referral in chicago what is the best way best way to reach me is by cell phone at 630-542-8688 or via email at rreal at dealwithreal.com I love it. And if you like this and want to hear more, you can go to the podcast, Real Estate Fight Club podcast found on all social medias. All right. Thanks, guys. Good thanks, Jen. Thanks, Saul. Take care.